Ken Curtis died tragically of a secret when his wife revealed it. Ken Curtis was born Curtis Wayne Gates on July 2, 1916, in Prowers County, a rural region located in southeastern Colorado. This area, part of the Great Plains, was known for its agricultural roots, with vast expanses of ranchland. Curtis spent the first 10 years of his life on a ranch located on Muddy Creek, a remote part of eastern Bent County. Growing up in such a rugged environment, young Curtis likely learned the values of hard work, self-reliance, and resilience, traits that would later influence his iconic roles in Western films. Life on the ranch was tough and demanded a deep connection to the land and animals. This early exposure to ranch life would serve Curtis well in his later acting career, especially as he became known for his roles in Westerns, where he portrayed cowboys and rugged frontiersmen. In 1926, when Curtis was 10 years old, his family relocated to Los Animas, the county seat of Bent County. This move was spurred by his father, Dan Sullivan Gates, running for the position of sheriff. The campaign was successful, and from 1926 to 1931, Dan Gates served as the sheriff of Bent County. This period must have been a formative time for young Curtis would have witnessed firsthand the responsibilities and dangers of law enforcement in a rural community. The family lived directly below the jail, as the entire second floor of the sheriff's residence was dedicated to housing inmates. This unique living arrangement meant that Curtis and his family were in constant proximity to the prisoners his father supervised. His mother, Nellie Sneed Gates, added another layer of complexity to this experience by cooking meals for the inmates a task that likely gave Curtis further insight into the human side of the prisoners. The jailhouse where the family lived has been preserved as a historical site and still stands on the grounds of the Bent County Courthouse in Los Animas. This building serves as a reminder of Curtis' early life and his family's connection to law enforcement and community service. Living so close to the jail undoubtedly exposed Curtis to the realities of justice, authority, and the challenges his father faced as sheriff in a rural county themes that would later resonate in his acting roles. During his high school years at Bent County High School, Curtis excelled both academically and athletically. He was the quarterback of the school's football team, a role that showcased his leadership abilities and competitive spirit. In addition to his athletic achievements, Curtis also played the clarinet in the school's band. His participation in both football and music demonstrated a wide range of talents, hinting at the versatility he would later exhibit in his professional life. Curtis graduated from high school in 1935, a milestone that set the stage for his future endeavors in music and acting. As the United States became involved in World War II, Curtis, like many young men of his generation, answered the call to serve his country. He enlisted in the United States Army in 1943 and served until 1945 contributing to the war effort during one of the most significant global conflicts of the 20th century. His military service likely instilled in him a sense of discipline and duty, which would later be reflected in the characters he portrayed on screen, particularly in roles that called for rugged masculinity and moral integrity. After the war, Curtis attended Colorado College with the intention of studying medicine. However, his passion for music soon outweighed his academic pursuits leading him to leave college and pursue a career in the entertainment industry. His decision to focus on music set him on a path that would lead to both musical and acting success. Curtis had always been musically inclined, and this talent became the cornerstone of his early career. Curtis' big break in music came when he joined the Tommy Dorsey Band in 1941 as a vocalist, replacing none other than Frank Sinatra. At that time, Sinatra was quickly becoming a national sensation and Curtis was seen as a strong replacement for the superstar. Curtis sang with Dorsey's band until 1942 when Sinatra was officially replaced by Dick Haynes. While Curtis' time with the band may have been brief, it was nonetheless a significant chapter in his early career, as performing with one of the top orchestras of the time gave him valuable exposure. Some suggest that Curtis may have been brought on as a kind of insurance policy in case Sinatra decided to leave the band earlier than anticipated. It was during this period that Tommy Dorsey suggested Curtis adopt the stage name Ken Curtis, marking the beginning of his transformation from an aspiring singer to a household name in both music and film. 
Following his stint with Dorsey's band, Curtis joined Shep Fields and his new music, a band known for its innovative sound. Fields' band was unique in that it featured an all reed section, meaning it relied solely on woodwind instruments with no brass section. This experimental approach to music was different from the typical big band sound of the era and allowed Curtis to further develop his vocal skills in a distinct musical setting. While working at Universal Studios, Curtis met Lorraine Page, who would become his first wife. The couple married in 1943, but the marriage did not last, and they eventually divorced. Despite this, Curtis's time at Universal was significant as it helped him transition from music to acting, setting the stage for his future in Hollywood. Curtis' success as a singer continued in the late 1940s when he became a featured performer on the popular country music radio program WWVA Jamboree, which was broadcast out of Wheeling, West Virginia. Curtis' smooth, rich voice made him a hit with listeners, and his involvement with WWVA Jamboree further solidified his place in the world of country music. In 1949, Curtis joined the Sons of the Pioneers, one of the most iconic country and western musical groups of the era. As the lead singer, Curtis helped the group achieve even greater success. During his time with the Sons of the Pioneers, Curtis recorded some of the group's most famous songs, including Room Full of Roses and Ghost, Riders in the Sky. These hits became timeless classics, and Curtis' voice helped define the sound of western music during the post-war period. His time with the Sons of the Pioneers also linked him to the larger tradition of westerns in American entertainment, blending his musical talent with the genre that would later dominate his acting career. Curtis's foray into Hollywood was marked by a contract with Columbia Pictures in 1945. The studio saw his potential as a multi-talented performer who could sing, act, and fit the mold of a classic western hero. He starred in a series of musical westerns, often playing the romantic cowboy led alongside the Hoosier Hot Shots, a novelty band that added comic elements to the films. These movies were a blend of Curtis' musical and acting talents, allowing him to ease into his eventual career as a leading man in westerns. A pivotal point in Curtis' career came through his connection to legendary director John Ford. Curtis' second marriage to Barbara Ford, John Ford's daughter, brought him into the orbit of Ford's iconic Western films. Curtis worked with both John Ford and John Wayne in the 1950 film Rio Grande. In the film, Curtis was part of a fictional band, the Regimental Singers, which was actually made up of members of the Sons of the Pioneers. Though his role was more musical than dramatic, it marked the beginning of his long-standing collaboration with Ford and Wayne, which would eventually lead to his most famous role as Festus Hagen on Gunsmoke. Ken Curtis' acting career spanned decades, and although he may have played bit parts in various films, he is most fondly remembered for his role as Charlie McCory in The Searchers, 1956, directed by the legendary John Ford. This iconic film, which starred John Wayne in one of his most celebrated performances, is considered a masterpiece of the Western genre. Curtis' portrayal of the antagonist McCory added depth to the film, making him a memorable presence in a star-studded cast. Beyond The Searchers, Curtis worked with Ford in other celebrated films such as The Quiet Man, 1952, The Wings of Eagles, 1957, The Horse Soldiers, 1959, The Alamo, 1960, and How the West Was Won, 1962. Each of these films holds a special place in American cinema history, and Curtis' participation in these projects further cemented his legacy as a talented character actor who could effortlessly move between roles in westerns and other genres. Curtis' collaboration with Ford extended to Mr. Roberts, 1955, a comedy set during World War II aboard a Navy cargo ship. In this film, Curtis shared the screen with some of Hollywood's biggest names, including Henry Fonda, James Cagney, William Powell, and Jack Lemmon. This ensemble cast delivered one of the most beloved service comedies of its era, with Curtis' performance contributing to the film's charm and success. The diversity of his roles in films like Mr. Roberts demonstrated Curtis's ability to adapt to different genres, showing he was much more than just a Western star. Another fascinating aspect of Curtis' career was his involvement in the three films produced by C.V. Whitney Pictures. 
Cornelius Vanderbilt Whitney, a wealthy businessman, philanthropist, and film producer, founded the production company and produced only three films, The Searchers, 1956, The Missouri Traveler, 1958, and The Young Land, 1959. Curtis was featured in all three, working alongside notable actors such as Brandon D. Wilde, Lee Marvin, Patrick Wayne, and Dennis Hopper. His participation in all three productions linked him to a unique moment in cinematic history, one where a new production company sought to make its mark on Hollywood through high-quality films that have stood the test of time. In Five Steps to Danger, 1957, Curtis played an uncredited role as FBI agent Jim Anderson. Although his part in this thriller was small, it reflected the breadth of his filmography, which included more than just westerns. This role, along with many others throughout his career, showed his versatility and ability to fit into different types of stories and characters, adding to his reputation as a reliable and talented actor. Beyond acting, Curtis was also involved behind the camera. In 1959, he produced two low-budget monster films, The Killer Shrews and The Giant Gila Monster. These films, though not critically acclaimed, have since achieved cult status in the realm of B-movie enthusiasts. The Killer Shrews, which featured giant mutated rodents, and the giant Gila monster, about a huge reptilian creature, became staples of drive-in theaters and late-night television. Curtis's involvement as a producer of these films showed that he had a broader interest in the filmmaking process beyond his acting roles. His willingness to produce such offbeat projects demonstrated his adventurous spirit and commitment to exploring different aspects of the entertainment industry. Curtis continued to make significant contributions to the Western genre. In the film adaptation of Conaher, 1991, based on a book by renowned Western author Louis L'Amour, Curtis starred opposite Sam Elliott. Playing the role of an aging cattleman, Curtis brought a seasoned, authentic quality to his performance sharing the screen with Elliot, who himself has become one of the most recognized faces of Western films. Conaher was well received by fans of the genre, and Curtis' role in the film was one of the highlights of his later career. Television was another important arena for Curtis, and he made a notable impact on several Western TV shows. One of his most significant contributions came from his five guest appearances on the highly popular series Have Gun, Will Travel, starring Richard Boone. This show was a staple of the Western genre during its run from 1957 to 1963, and Curtis's guest spots added to the richness of the series. In 1959, he appeared as cowhand Phil Jakes in the Gunsmoke episode titled Jayhawkers, further cementing his connection to one of the most beloved Western television shows in history. Curtis also made an appearance in an episode of Perry Mason, titled The Case of the Clumsy Clown, which aired on November 5, 1960. In this episode, Curtis portrayed Tim Durant, a circus performer. This guest role highlighted his ability to step into different kinds of characters, even outside the Western genre, in one of television's most enduring legal dramas. The Perry Mason episode allowed Curtis to showcase his range as an actor in a setting entirely different from the dusty plains and frontier towns of his usual Western roles. Another notable television project for Curtis was Ripcord, an action-adventure series centered around a company providing skydiving services. Running from 1961 to 1963, with 76 episodes in total, Curtis played the role of James Buckley, with Larry Pennell as his co-star. Curtis' portrayal of a seasoned skydiving expert showed his ability to adapt to different action-oriented roles while the show itself helped popularize sports parachuting in the early 1960s. His performance in Ripcord demonstrated that Curtis could take on modern action roles as well, adding another dimension to his already diverse career. In 1964, Curtis appeared in the syndicated Western television series Death Valley Days in the episode Graydon's Charge. He played the role of Graydon, a mule skinner, and appeared alongside Denver Pyle and Kathy Lewis. Death Valley Days was a long-running Western anthology series that told historical stories of the American West. Curtis's participation in this series was another testament to his enduring connection to the genre that had defined so much of his career. Ken Curtis remains best known for his portrayal of Festus Hagen, the scruffy, cantankerous, and illiterate deputy on Gunsmoke, one of the most iconic Western television series in American history. 
His performance as Festus became an indelible part of the show's identity, earning him a lasting place in the hearts of Western fans. Despite the fact that Marshall Matt Dillon, played by James Arness, had a total of five deputies over the show's two-decade run, Curtis' portrayal of Festus held the longest tenure, appearing in 304 episodes. His remarkable longevity in the role set him apart as the defining deputy on Gunsmoke, and his nuanced performance contributed to the series' continued success during its later years. The character of Festus Hagen was patterned after a real-life individual from Curtis's childhood in Los Animas, Colorado, Frederick Munden, more commonly known as Cedar Jack. Curtis grew up around Cedar Jack, who lived roughly 15 miles south of town and earned his living by cutting and selling cedar fence posts. Cedar Jack was a familiar figure to the locals, not only for his rustic trade but also for his habit of coming into town, often ending up intoxicated and, as Curtis would later recall, spending nights in the local jail, which happened to be run by Curtis's father, Dan Gates. These formative experiences with Cedar Jack would become the foundation for Festa's distinct personality on Gunsmoke, an affable but gruff country type who brought an element of humor and rough-around-the-edges charm to the show. One of Festa's most defining characteristics was his nasally, twangy rural accent, which Curtis developed specifically for the role. The voice, with its exaggerated hillbilly cadence, became a signature part of the character's persona. Audiences came to associate the voice with Festus so strongly that many viewers were unaware it was entirely an invention of Curtis. In reality, Ken Curtis's own voice bore little resemblance to Festus, as Curtis spoke in a much more polished and neutral tone, having previously worked as a singer and actor with a completely different vocal style. The transformation Curtis undertook to create Festus highlighted his range as a performer and his dedication to crafting an authentic, memorable character for the small screen. Curtis' success as Festus extended beyond his performances on Gunsmoke. Like many television stars of his time, he participated in personal appearances across the country to promote the show, but his efforts went even further. During the off-seasons of Gunsmoke, Curtis took his talents on the road, performing in Western-themed stage shows at fairs, rodeos, and other venues. His live appearances allowed him to interact with fans directly, deepening his connection with the public and strengthening his status as a beloved figure in Western entertainment. Even after Gunsmoke was cancelled in 1975, Curtis continued to perform at such events, keeping the spirit of the show alive and maintaining his connection to the genre he had become so closely associated with. In addition to his show business engagements, Curtis also ventured into the political arena, supporting Ronald Reagan's 1976 campaign for the Republican presidential nomination. Reagan, who had been a film actor himself before entering politics, found a kindred spirit in Curtis, and Curtis' support reflected his alignment with Reagan's political philosophy. Though Reagan did not secure the nomination in 1976, his relationship with Curtis reflected the blending of Hollywood and politics that became increasingly prominent as Reagan's political career advanced. Curtis's career was filled with notable collaborations and guest appearances beyond Gunsmoke. One particularly interesting connection was with actor Carol O'Connor, who guest starred on two episodes of Gunsmoke during its run. Years later, Curtis would guest star on O'Connor's hit NBC show In the Heat of the Night, where he portrayed a retired police detective. This small but memorable role showcased Curtis' versatility as an actor and provided a reunion between the two television veterans. In 1973, Curtis lent his voice to the character Nutsy the Vulture in Disney's animated film Robin Hood, adding to his varied career in both live action and voiceover work. Curtis's vocal performance brought humor to the beloved animated classic, further demonstrating his wide-ranging talents. Curtis returned to television again in the 1980s with a role on The Yellow Rose, a short-lived but critically appreciated Western series in which he worked closely with fellow Western actor Noah Beery Jr. While The Yellow Rose only lasted for one season, it reaffirmed Curtis standing in the Western genre and allowed him to continue performing in the type of roles he loved. His enduring legacy as a Western performer was solidified in 1981 when he was inducted into the Western Performers Hall of Fame at the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum in Oklahoma City.
This prestigious honor recognized Curtis' contributions to the genre and his role in shaping the television western's enduring appeal. Curtis's final acting role came in 1991 in the television production Conaher, adapted from a novel by famed western author Louis L'Amour. He portrayed the aging cattle rancher Seaburn Tay, bringing to life one of his last great western characters alongside Sam Elliott, who starred in the title role. Curtis's Gunsmoke co-star, Buck Taylor, also appeared in Conaher, adding a layer of nostalgia for longtime Gunsmoke fans. Notably, Buck Taylor's father, Dub Taylor, had a minor role in the same production, creating a multi-generational link to Curtis' earlier work. Conaher served as a fitting final chapter in Curtis' career, as it encapsulated his lifelong association with the Western genre. Throughout his career, Ken Curtis established himself as a beloved actor who excelled in roles that reflected the rugged, independent spirit of the American West. From his defining role as Festus Hagen on Gunsmoke to his continued contributions to Western entertainment through live performances and later television appearances, Curtis' legacy as one of the great performers in the Western genre remains secure. His ability to embody the grit, humor, and humanity of characters like Festus left an indelible mark on television history and his work continues to be celebrated by fans of classic westerns today. Ken Curtis married Tori Connolly in 1966, and their relationship lasted until his passing in 1991. Although Ken did not have any biological children of his own, he embraced his role as a stepfather to Tori's two children, becoming a significant figure in their lives. Curtis' deep affection for his stepchildren highlighted his nurturing character and he took pride in being part of their upbringing, treating them as his own. His family relationships, both through marriage and extended family, played a crucial role in his later years, offering a sense of stability and warmth that he cherished. The bond with Tori and the children shaped much of his personal life during the last decades of his life, as he transitioned from his on-screen persona to a more private, family-oriented existence. One prominent tribute to Curtis's legacy is a statue of him as Festus, his most beloved character from Gunsmoke. The statue, located at 430 Pulaski Avenue in Clovis, California, in Fresno County, stands as a testament to his iconic role in television history. Positioned in front of the Educational Employees Credit Union, the statue draws fans and passers-by who fondly remember his portrayal of the gruff, yet lovable deputy. Clovis holds a special significance to Curtis, as it was where he spent his later years. His residence in Clovis allowed him to live in relative peace, away from the hustle and bustle of Hollywood, while still maintaining a connection with his fanbase. The statue continues to serve as a symbol of his enduring influence on the Western genre and his lasting impact on the cultural landscape of American television. Ken Curtis was also an active supporter of the Republican Party, and his political beliefs were made evident during the 1964 United States presidential election when he publicly endorsed conservative candidate Barry Goldwater. Curtis's political stance reflected his personal values, which aligned with the ideals of individualism, patriotism, and traditional American values often associated with the Western characters he portrayed. His support for Goldwater was consistent with the rugged, self-reliant persona he embodied both on and off the screen. Curtis's endorsement showed that he wasn't just a television star, but also a citizen deeply engaged in the political discourse of his time. His Republican alignment also resonated with many of his fans, who admired his straightforward, no-nonsense demeanor. As Curtis entered his later years, his life took on a quieter, more introspective tone. His third marriage to Tori Connolly provided him with much-needed companionship and happiness. Despite his success in his acting career, Curtis longed for a peaceful, harmonious life in his final years. However, even in this period of tranquility, he faced significant personal challenges. Health issues began to take their toll, and Curtis experienced a series of medical complications, including heart problems that became life-threatening. There were moments of immense strain within his marriage, which, though generally loving and supportive, was not without its difficulties. Arguments occasionally flared up, causing stress and further health issues for Curtis. His heart condition worsened over time, and one particularly intense disagreement reportedly resulted in him suffering a heart attack. This incident deeply affected him and his relationship with Tori, 
marking a poignant chapter in their marriage. Curtis often spoke of his regrets, reflecting on the opportunities he missed due to his demanding career. His busy schedule and long hours on set had kept him away from his loved ones for extended periods, which led to feelings of guilt in his later years. According to Tori, Curtis struggled with the weight of these regrets, feeling that he had not been present enough for the people he cared about most. These emotions compounded the stress of his health issues, contributing to the psychological burden he carried. Nevertheless, Curtis found solace in his marriage to Tori, acknowledging that their time together brought him the most peace and contentment, even if it was tinged with moments of sadness and unresolved pain. In his final years, Ken Curtis faced even greater physical challenges, including a period when he was confined to a wheelchair. The loss of mobility was a major blow to a man who had been so active and vibrant throughout his career. However, Curtis demonstrated resilience and determination, eventually managing to regain some of his independence and walking again before his death. His perseverance during this difficult time was characteristic of the strength he had shown throughout his life, both as an actor and as a person. Unfortunately, on April 28, 1991, Ken Curtis passed away in his sleep from a heart attack in Fresno, California. His death marked the end of a remarkable life, filled with triumphs and trials, both professionally and personally. Curtis was cremated, and his ashes were scattered in the Colorado flatlands, a fitting final resting place for a man whose career was so closely tied to the western landscape. His ashes now rest in the vast, open plains symbolizing the enduring spirit of the American West that he brought to life on screen. Ken Curtis's legacy lives on through his work, his family, and the memories of those who loved him. His portrayal of Festus, his contributions to the world of entertainment, and the personal battles he fought in his later years all contribute to the rich, complex legacy of a man who was much more than just a television cowboy.